Hi everyone, welcome back to Faraday Academy and another video. My name is Gwen and in this video, I really want to answer some questions that people have been asking me, messaging me or emailing me over the last few weeks. Now, I used to do Q&A streams over on Instagram, but since I have a lot more followers over here on YouTube and the questions kind of come in from every different platform, I think that YouTube might be a better central location to put future Q&A videos. So I'm gonna start off with a couple questions today. And if you have any more questions for me, please leave them in the comments on this video. And I'll also be responding to questions from other social media, so Twitter, Instagram, etc. So this first question is actually a common question that I've gotten a lot over the years. And that is, what is the right way to learn a programming language. Now, I do cover this quite a bit in my book on how to break down the learning steps from planning and preparation and then learning from the fundamentals. And then just in general, when you're learning a new programming language, what are the steps in which you should learn it? Basically, to give you kind of the TLDR quick version, once you have a goal and you know that you want to learn the language, you need a plan and a structure for learning the language. Now that requires a little bit of research. Fortunately, there are many websites that will give you an already well thought out structure and kind of backbone for your learning. So instead of first diving into a course or taking a tutorial, you should take your goal, let's say you want to learn JavaScript so you can be a front-end web developer or start to build web apps, then you can take that and find out all of the steps that you need to do along the way, all of the different topics that you are going to need to learn to achieve that goal, and then you can build out your own curriculum or find a curriculum that matches all of the different things that you will need to learn. For example, the free code camp curriculum or taking one of the boot camps on Udemy or a Udacity course or whatever it is, whatever fits your learning style. And I talk about this a little bit over in my how to create your own coding curriculum video, so you can check that out. But the biggest problem that I see with learning a language is actually that people get caught in something called tutorial hell. So they just keep going down this rabbit hole of doing tutorial after tutorial and it leads to a very shallow understanding. Yeah, you can go through the motions, you kind of understand it on the surface level, but unless you really go through the grind of stopping after you do a tutorial and trying to build something on your own and working through it on your own without the step-by-step -step instructions, then you're really never going to get a deep understanding of the concepts. So when you're learning a language, I recommend just learning the basics and then try to build something as early as possible. And some curriculums like certain coding schools or free code camp, they give you lots of different projects to work on along the way. And the projects don't have step-by-step -step instructions. So you are going to have to look at the project, figure out what needs to be built, break it down into step-by-step -step instructions for yourself, and then go off and build it piece by piece and struggle at every step along the way trying to figure out what is the process and the right way to do everything. Now those things really get you used to the fundamentals and to working in the language, but the next step is really to sure up your foundations in the language, make sure you really understand what's going on. And for that, I really recommend two things. So the first thing and what everyone will recommend is diving into the documentation, which can be daunting and very difficult, which is why it's usually not a good idea, especially if you're an inexperienced developer to do that right at the beginning. It's usually best to learn a language at first through someone who is already an expert teaching a course on it or something like that. Then kind of struggle through it on your own, get a good understanding through maybe building a small project or two, and then you can kind of get a deeper dive into the language, which is where it's important to really start reading documentations. And another great way I've found to deep dive into 
a true understanding of a programming language is through watching conference talks. And one really great thing now is that you don't even have to attend a conference to watch the conference talks because most of the conferences that I see now are posting their talks for free on YouTube a certain amount of days after the conference ends. You'll kind of have to search around for what are the best conferences for the ecosystem that you are working on. If you're working in mobile development, there are plenty of general mobile development conferences as well as ones on specific technologies like React Native, for example. So I have a couple more recommendations for learning computer languages. The first is to get rid of the thought, oh, I don't get it, I must not be smart enough or I must not be cut out for this. You have to consider that maybe for that concept, it's just going to take you a little bit longer or maybe you haven't had it explained to you in the right way. For example, when I first heard about APIs, I didn't get what they were until I asked somebody and then he explained it to me so simply that I was like, oh, of course. And that explanation stuck with me ever since. But at first I was kind of beating myself up thinking, oh, I can't get this, you know, I'm not smart enough to understand these kind of programming topics. The second thing I recommend is not to pick a problem that's too difficult right away. One thing that a lot of people seem to do is have some kind of really challenging, huge problem that they want to solve that they're dying to get to. So maybe they're learning this programming language so that they can build this really complicated tool that solves a problem that they really want to solve. But if you're just learning a language, that's probably not the first thing that you want to tackle. You want to slowly build up to that, building smaller projects, getting a good understanding of the programming language before building this passion project that you really want to exist. And one final thing I want to say about tutorials is that a lot of times you'll start going through a tutorial and you'll try the code out for yourself and it might not work on your machine. So don't get discouraged. Don't get down. You know, everybody's machine can be a little bit different. Your environment, your browser, whatever can be different. So that can actually be used as a good learning tool to learn how to debug your environment, check all of the versions of all the software you're running, Maybe you need to make some updates or check what the teacher is using. Maybe he's using something a little bit different than what you are using or what you thought he was using. So if you don't get something right away or if the tutorial code or whatever application isn't working right away, try to change your mindset and think of it as a potential learning opportunity instead of a stressful challenge and why isn't anything working for me like that? The next question, that some people have asked me is, do I offer private lessons? And the answer is no. So I used to tutor and offer lessons and stuff, but I just don't have the capacity with everything going on to do that anymore. So I try to provide helpful tutorials and make courses and stuff like that, and also answer as many questions as possible. But as far as private one-on-one lessons, I don't have the capacity for that anymore. So the next question is, where do you recommend hosting a developer portfolio for a beginner who's just starting? Now, my answer to this question in 2021 is definitely use your GitHub profile page for a portfolio. You can include a readme at the top with all kinds of links and information and an overview about who you are and your skills and all that sort of thing. It also has the section where you can pin your top projects. So projects that you want, maybe potential future employers or whoever to be able to see. It also shows your coding history, those green squares that you can fill in, showing that you've been actively coding and trying to improve your skills. And then it also has a record at the bottom of all of the different actions and things you've contributed to and issues and basically all of your community involvement. Of course, on the left, you can put your professional profile picture and then you can also put any links or personal information, job, that kind of stuff. 
So it's really a great place to put your portfolio for very low effort because it's usually not a good use of your time to build an elaborate portfolio or worry about portfolio hosting. In the beginning, you're mostly working on building projects to put in your portfolio. And anyway, you're going to need a GitHub just as a software developer now, especially if you're looking for your first job, it's pretty much a requirement to have an active GitHub. And now there are so many ways, as I mentioned, to make it look and feel like a really nice professional portfolio. Of course, on top of that, I recommend you also have a blog. So the number one platform that I recommend for a blog now is using Hashnode. There's also Dev.2, which is really good, but I recommend putting your portfolio on GitHub and then starting a Hashnode blog and linking them to each other. And I talk about that a little bit more in my book, Learn to Code, Get a Job as well. The next question that I've been getting is, can beginners follow my Twitch streams? So this is really something that I've been trying to cater to, to keep my Twitch streams somewhat accessible to beginners. So I know I got into the weeds on a couple of projects and it might not have been as easy to follow, but right now I am going through all of the Free Code Camp Python projects on my Twitch streams for the next month or two. So those should be pretty easy to follow. If you have any suggestions for future streams, I'm definitely open to those as well. And then also when I do algorithm streams, so code wars, coding games, stuff like that. I think those are really good challenges for beginners. So even if you can't solve the challenge, at least you can get used to reading the problem, breaking it down, writing pseudo code, and you know trying to get through the first couple steps anyway. And I try not to make those challenges last more than, on co well, on coding games, it's 15 minutes, and on code wars, it might be 30, 45 minutes, something like that. Someone asked if I have a YouTube video on modern software development. So I get some of these kind of broad questions and it's really difficult to answer because there are so many different facets of modern software development. But I will say that all of my videos are geared toward modern and up-to-date technologies. So I really don't think that I use legacy technology in any of my videos. I use the latest versions of Python, JavaScript, frameworks, and then I also talk about modern agile development processes in a video, for example, Docker. Everything should be up to date or as up to date as possible on my channel. Someone asked a very interesting question. What is the future of automated testing? So I want to say that I'm not a professional automated tester. so. I'm not going to go into specific tools and technologies, but the future I see for not just automated testing, but also a lot of facets of coding is that tools and platforms will become easier and easier for developers to simply plug and play. And this kind of, I think, goes along with the node code movement where more and more things are going to be interface driven just click a couple buttons, you'll be able to set things up like parts of a web page or automated tests and all of that stuff. And we're going to see more and more of those tools that will require less manual coding and manual setup. If you want more information on automated testing, um, I'm probably not the best person to ask, but if anyone has a good recommendation for maybe another content creator who does work in automated testing and has videos on automated testing, then let us know, post in the comments below. So someone asked, what database do I see the most in production? So for me, that's easily Postgres. And it seems that virtually every company that I worked at or worked with consulting or talked to seems to be going toward Postgres right now. Of course, some companies I've worked with will use that in conjunction with another 
database for certain things like big data. They might use DynamoDB. And I've also worked with Mongo and MySQL and then even SQL Server. So companies that seem to use Microsoft projects, uh, C Sharp, .NET, that sort of thing, they seem to go toward SQL Server. And then most other companies from my experience tend to be using something like Postgres, which I think is kind of the industry standard if you're going to use a SQL database. I know there's a lot of popularity around NoSQL databases, so Mongo and Dynamo and all of those kind of databases, and I've definitely seen some of those and used some of those in projects, but overall, I would say the popularity doesn't seem to be nearly at the level of SQL, at least not yet. Last question that I have is from someone who messaged me saying that they're in school and they also have an internship, but they want to learn to code. So is it possible when they don't have much time? If you've seen my videos about learning to code, I recommend trying to do it for at least three hours a day. And many other people will say, that you need to do 10 to 20 hours a week or whatever. So it seems like you need a lot of time. So I think in this person's situation, they don't have much time, so they think maybe they can't learn to code yet. I just wanna say that the recommendations that you should do it several hours a day or 10 to 20 hours a week or whatever, that's really based off of the goal that you want to get your first developer job as soon as possible. But if you're doing a lot of other activities, you have a lot of other obligations right now, and you just want to kind of learn the basics and slowly progress, then there are a lot of tools that don't require a lot of local setup now that you can just start using and learn to code right away. For example, the platforms Free Code Camp, Code Academy, and some mobile apps like Grasshopper you can download those, have them set up, or sign up for an account or whatever, and have them ready to go so whenever you have even 15 minutes of free time, you can go through a lesson or a small challenge or something, and then just keep going step by step. So even if you're only spending maybe two hours a week total, you can really start to get the basics of learning to code and then in the future, when you want to maybe go further or start building applications or something, you're already going to have the foundations down. So I don't believe at all that it's a waste of time if you only have a few hours a week. It all depends on what your goal is. If your goal is just to learn the foundations to kind of get your feet wet with coding and give yourself a good starting point for later, then I highly recommend you get a mobile app Grasshopper, or like I mentioned, Free Code Camp or Code Academy, sign up for one of those accounts and just start slowly working through one challenge at a time. And before you know it, you're going to have all of the basics and foundations ready for when you want to take it further. I hope this was helpful. If you have anything to add to any of these suggestions or any additional questions, please leave them in the comments below. I hope you all are having a great week. Don't forget to check out my Twitch channel for my next Python stream, and I will see you all in the next video.